welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is a brand new author and exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel and from the wonderful mind of David Morning Wee. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further and why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story and title. The Mountain, Part 4, The Storm of Hell. Let's get straight into that. The handsome man knelt down and opened his box, revealing three different and unique items. He removed a very large black key first, about the size of a loaf of bread, and with runes covering it that glowed like intense fire. Although the key was remarkably light, it carried with it an all-consuming aura of pure dread, like Wade was holding something that no human should ever touch. And This made him hand it back to the handsome man rather quickly, where he placed it back and withdrew the second item. Its shining gold horn was handed to Wade, and unlike the black key, the horn radiated positive energy and felt slightly warm and tingly to the touch. It had beautiful looking sigils, and Wade noticed it was actually made of an elegant white metallic substance that radiated golden energy, which Wade first mistook for being actual metal. Ending the trifecta of the box's contents, the man retrieved the third and final item. He presented a pristine looking crystal jar, in which a white mist like energy seemed to be infused with the crystal itself, making it glow ever so faintly. The handsome gentleman spent the next 15 minutes explaining exactly how and when to use these special items. The man gave absolutely no explanations as to what the items were or what they even did upon putting them into play, only the order of their use and precisely how and when to use them. I am sending a very good friend to assist you in battling the Ancient One. In fact, said the handsome man to Wade, I believe you have already briefly met. But before Wade could say a word, the man continued on. If my friend perishes, please open the crystal jar I gave you and let his essence go inside. He will be drawn to it and then release that essence inside the lock room, please. Ow! yelled Wade looking at his hand and watched his blood float from his palm, where a small cutter now appeared and his blood glided its way to the box, where it dispersed and flew inside each of the locks making it shut closed. Wade watched the small wound on his palm heal instantly while the handsome man spoke. This box will only open for you now, Wade. Nothing besides your free will can open it now. Good luck and God bless, said the handsome man as he swiftly exited the mansion and drove away into the night. Wade walked over to the black box in which he apparently now claimed ownership of and knelt down to open it. The box opened effortlessly for him, and upon doing so, Wade saw a note that was not there originally, and peered it up to examine its contents, where it read as such. Wade, do not underestimate the creature known as Lochran. He is not like the rest of his kind, both genetically and personally. He used the teleportation stone to instantly transmit behind me, and although they are single-use artifacts, I sense more, which means he still has at least one more stone at his disposal. I've been spying on the darkness for a very long time now, and Lochran, although not as powerful, is far more capable and intelligent than the ancient Lakori he awaits. He has a knack for surviving and always finding a way to come out on top, regardless of the odds he faces. He is a rare and lethal combination of patience, power, and intelligence. In fact, the monster is a genius that always seems to have a plan B and C. Most likely, he will just use the teleportation stone to save himself and transport to a safe location. But do not underestimate him or give him any opening. Adhere to the training Rose taught you and do everything I instructed you to do exactly. If you do so, victory and glory will be yours, my friends. Away closed the piece of paper and exhaled deeply while shaking his head from side to side. An electronic humming sound issued from the living room and upon Wade and Daniel inspecting the situation, they noticed a hideaway flat-screen TV was slowly ascending from the hardwood floor in the living room. Hey boys, a strong feminine voice said right before the two men reached the flat-screen. 
Hey, Rose, said Danny excitedly. Thanks for sending a model to give us more stuff, but why didn't he stay? It seemed like he could have really helped out, too. But Rose cut in before he could finish his sentence. We have no clue who that was, and if you didn't dispose of the quarry, I would tell you to throw that box in the hyper incinerator downstairs. I'm still debating it, actually. But, eh. she sighed tiredly. We simply just do not have the time to reevaluate things, let alone come up with a whole new game plan. No, we must have faith that the creator sent him to us. And more importantly, Arella herself said we can trust a man wholly and completely. And so that's more than enough to stave my doubts. Now, I'm going to need you boys to open a black sliding glass door and prepare yourselves to not freak out. Your backup has just arrived. You'll soon see why John had to make the back entrance so large, Rose said laughing, just a bit. And please, allow them to take their pick of weapons and artifacts. Not that they would need your permission. Why, it's just polite. Uh, sure, answered Wade. We almost have everything at the ready, he said, nodding at the wall behind the couch, where he and Daniel had an assortment of weapons and magical items lined up against the back wall. Oh, Rose, exclaimed Wade hurriedly. Lockram mentioned a trader that helped. It's already handled, interrupted Rose. Just do everything I said with those mechs and weapons, and you should be fine. I'll pray for you all. God bless. And with that final statement, the screen retracted back into the floor, taking Rose with it. Well, Daniel said while walking towards the back sliding door, which was ridiculously huge indeed. It spanned about 15 feet high. I'm going to go ahead and open this up for fr uh, friends. Daniel drew the word out slowly, and from the shock of what stood outside before him. Daniel stood frozen in place like a deer in the headlines, not being able to even mutter a word yet. And four fully transformed and hulking lichens stood waiting outside the door, surveying the area behind them every few seconds as not to be taken off guard by Lochran. The one in front pointed at the door handle with a dagger-like claw, staring at Daniel. The awestruck young man came out of his shocked days, apologising and quickly opened the back door. Uh, come in? Daniel said hesitantly. Is that a request or a question, kid? One of the werewolves in the back said, laughing. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I'm Daniel. Daniel started to apologise in mild panic but was silenced when an oversized dark brown furry clawed hand softly landed on his shoulder. It's all right, kid. He's just messing with you. Everything is going to be fine. And Daniel noticed that the polite creature retracted his claws before he actually grabbed his shoulder. And although Wade and Daniel were priorly informed of the arrival of such creatures by Lochran's comment on the balcony, neither man expected a sight that stood before them. Two of them had dark brown fur, one black and the last a silver shiny coat that was quite unique. But that's not what took the men off guard, though. No, it was the fact that they were all wearing battle armor. Now, the armor was not simple or primitive by any means. It looked to be the combination of a metallic substance with both high-tech and magical components infused into some kind of customized royal knight's armor. It didn't cover their entire body, just about 80%, and with gaps in places that to not slow their movements, and with the armor being thicker over the lichen's vulnerable areas. The armor was also covered in magical runes that glowed a divine whitish tint like their eyes, which looked as if the moon itself sat in their pupils, like the irises were composed of pure lunar energy, like a full moon, which tonight was not. On top of all this was a unique technical aspect to their battle attire, gauntlets which appeared to have a rotating ammo drum around a tri-barrel nozzle, on which the top barrel was larger than the twin bottom two. The elbows and knees had a similar structure, but with two over and the under barrels, and with the top barrel being larger than the bottom as well. Even though weapons appeared to have weapons fused on, the lighter portions of armor seemed to move fluently, perfectly matching any movement they made, giving it a visible consistency somewhere between solid and liquid. Now, we could tell at least two of the lichen warriors were high ranking or even royalty, but one of the larger dark brown lichens wore a golden armor and the other silver furred one wore a shiny platinum armor that almost matched his fur, save for how parts of the armor shine pristinely. The last two 
one with black fur the same size as the golden leader, and the other dark brown furred one, who was considerably larger than the others in both bulk and height. Both wore a dark grey armour that still contained all the lethal technical and magical components as the first two, just without the precious metal flare. So, who's Wade and who's Daniel? said the lycan wearing the golden armour. I'm Wade and this is Daniel. Wade said pointing vaguely at Daniel with his thumb. I am General Raiden, said the golden lycan, an obvious leader. This is my new lieutenant, Thorn, pointing a clawed index finger at the silver wolf, who was just a bit shorter than the rest, but exceptionally muscled. This is Reinhardt, he said pointing at the other dark brown lycan about his own height. And this mountain of muzzle in the back is Warbane, referring to the extra large black furred lichen. Wait a minute, said Wade worriedly while backing up slowly. Lochran said that the lichen lieutenant had betrayed everyone and helped the Lakori bring an army through. That's why he said new no, lieutenant, answered Thorn. That's right, said the general. I ripped out his throat myself for the monumental betrayal. And if I have been more observant, from the beginning, none of this would have come to pass. I accept full responsibility for this devastating oversight, said the general in a melancholy and partially defeated sounding tone. Ah, it's not your fault, said Thorn. That's right, Warbane added. We all trusted him, sir. Uh, excuse me, said Wade as he gestured towards the wall. But there are still a bunch of weapons and items here if you need anything. Danny and I are pretty loaded down as it is. Yes, I can see that, said Raiden in slight surprise. Do you have any experience operating a sword and shield? Mechsuit, the general asked, pointing at the light yet extremely high-tech looking chest armor they wore, which an illuminated S with a sword through it vertically was lit up visibly in the center of Wade's armor, whereas Daniels had an illuminated shield with a glowing S in the middle. Uh, yes, answered Wade. Not only did we practice all their immediate functions for over five hours straight, but also had the suits cooperatively, work together as one. Yeah, Daniel jumped in enthusiastically. Since I have intermediate martial arts and kickboxing skills, I took the shield, and since Wade is a hunter and an excellent marksman, he obviously took the sword. Are you also familiar with the nano-dispersion sequence? Where in case you take on too much damage and need to abort, while still dispersing the suit's remains at enemies like shrapnel. Yes, said Wade. I mean, after you understand the process, it's mostly just pointed, added Daniel confidently. Good, said Ryden, apparently pleased with the two men's answer. Now, help me set up these orb staffs and rocket launchers by the front door. The others should be gathering up another large projectile weaponry from inside. While we work, Wade, I'm going to need you to fill me in whatever the blonde man told and gave you. More importantly, why? said Ryden. After about twenty minutes of preparing weaponry, and Wade explaining everything in detail about the mysterious handsome man, including the exact instructions the man gave for the box's contents, everyone gathered in the living room to discuss their battle plan. Wade looked around, now understanding why John has such very high ceilings, for the lichens fit everywhere quite comfortably. Well, Ryden began. I suppose it now comes down to one question. Do we trust the handsome man? Which everyone had now officially dubbed him. Do we have a choice? Thorn added. Not if what the Lochran said is true, answered Ryden. But regardless, we're going to need eyes on the north side of the mountain, for sure. Getting caught off guard by fifty Lokori and an ancient will not put us in a good position. I hope John has a plan, like a really, really good plan, exclaimed Thorm impatiently. Fifty Lokori, and an ancient even with a sword and shield max run by experts. It will be highly improbable to win, Raiden, said Thorn. Well, there won't be any shortness of glory now, will there? answered Raiden. All right then, Thorn said excitedly now. Just making sure we all understand. Glory! It is. Ryder then brought out a box that was green, and little glowing pink designs and sigils radiating all over it. And when the box was opened, 
A pink glowing ball of light slowly floated out and hovered in place, directly in front of Ryden's face. Hello, Flora, Ryden began. We're going to need eyes on the far north side of the mountain peak. We're expecting some rather unpleasant company, and soon. Yes, answered Flora, who waited she to be a fairy. I can already sense a tear in a veil that is in that direction growing weaker by the minute. We don't have much time. There is a single Lakore pacing around the woodline, Raiden. An unnaturally powerful one at that too, warned Flora. Yes, he is alone until his backup arrives, said Raiden. Sir, maybe it's just easier if we take him out now, said Reinhardt. No, Wade loudly interrupted. He has a teleportation stone, likely more than one. The entire quad of Lycan's turned to stare at Wade. The handsome man told me, said Wade. I saw Lockeran use one to try and get the jump on him with my own eyes, but he got his ass royally kicked instead. The handsome man also told me never to underestimate him, and that he has lots of tricks up his sleeve and a genius level of intelligence. Hmm, teleportation stones are very, very rare, said Ryden seriously. If he's managed to acquire more than one then perhaps this mysterious blond guy is right about Lochran. Sir, I can't stress enough how quickly we are running out of time, said Flora worriedly. Right and opened the front door, and everyone watched as the ferry hurriedly flew through the woods, illuminating the ground and trees and with a pink glow as she traversed through the forest. As she flew about thirty feet in, two large pink spears became visible, perfectly parallel to one another. No doubt the giant black glossy eyes of Lochran. Instead of absorbing the lights as usual, Flora's energy was easily reflected upon his eyes. No doubt due to some sort of fairy magic. Did you? Wade started and was answered before his question could conclude. Yeah, I saw him, answered Ryden. At least we know where he is. A soft feminine voice screamed from within the forest in apparent panic before Ryden could shut the door. Wade, oh God, please help me. Wade grabbed the customized AA-12 fully auto shotgun from the weapons that placed by the door and ran outside, throwing all fear and caution to the wind. Sarah, screamed Wade, walking towards the forest in a panicked yet determined demeanor. Sarah, I'm here. Please, where are you? Everyone armed and outside now, yelled Ryden as he grabbed a particularly large L7A2 general purpose machine gun. They had extra large customizations in order to fit the Larkins' larger biology, as did about one third of all the weapons. Reinhardt and Warbane wasted no time as the first grabbed the Anzio, 20mm rifle that was taller than a grown man, and a magnum revolver so large that it looked almost comical. While the latter grabbed a rotating minigun and followed Ryden outside. And Daniel tried grabbing an L7A2 similar to Ryder's before Thorne stopped him. Whoa, kid, said Thorne, halting him. That may be a bit much for you. Here, try this. Thorne said, grabbing the L7A2 and thrusting a different weapon in his hands. This is a next generation machine gun your military is developing. It fires 6.8mm rounds and an extra large capacity, and won't flail around everywhere while you're firing it. We have enough to worry about without throwing friendly fire in the mix. Thorne said grinning at him, which made Daniel flinch at the sight. Are you smiling at me? asked Daniel. Yeah, kid, answered Thorn, laughing. Well, it's, it's terrifying, said Daniel, referring to the massive fangs and overpowered jaw of the lichen being curled upwards at him. And after a short burst of shared laughter, Thorn and Daniel rushed outside to aid the others, just in time to see Wade almost at the forest edge, before Raiden leaped a distance no less than 100 yards landed in front of Wade, facing the woods. Ryden quickly turned to face Wade, kneeling down a bit to face his eye level in order to explain and dissuade him from going any further. Lochran is tricking you, Wade. They can sense our greatest fears and regrets in order to manipulate their prey. Please, Wade, it's a trap. Just follow me back and I can explain more. Ryden pleaded, glancing back every few seconds to make sure the demon was not advancing on them. Wade lowered his weapon and began to follow Ryden as the others covered their approach. I trusted you, Wade, 
The woman's voice cried out again. You were supposed to protect me, but you drove me right into the grave. I didn't even want to go. You talked me into it, remember? You said it would be fun, but it's not fun, Wade. Here in hell. Unspeakable things are done to me over and over, and it's all your fault. You put me here, Wade. It's your fault. I'm dead. The voice had turned from pleading and feminine into a more guttural and threatening tone, becoming more low-pitched and demonic as it carried on, until finally it was just Lochran's voice, laughing a maniacal hysteria. A tear ran down Wade's cheek as all six warriors stood lined up in front of the mansion, weapons raised, listening to Lochran get a sick pleasure out of Wade's emotional pain. Daniel peered from one end of the line of warriors to the other, when a mischievous grin appeared on his face before he stated loudly, Man, let's just predator this motherfucker. Everyone broke formation, but they had been aiming into the woods and stared quizzically at Daniel. Predator him? Warbane asked, apparently as confused as the others. Yeah, answered Daniel, amped up a bit. Like in the movie Predator. After the creature kills the big cowboy guy, and his body picks up his minigun, and the whole squadron lines up with him and just unloads. Yeah, I've seen it, kid, said Thorn. They cut the jungle in half, use up almost all of the ammo, and barely graze the creature once. Is that the game plan you mean? Thorn asked, laughing a bit, in jest. It was still badass, though, Daniel replied confidently, and laughing a bit at himself as the majority of the warriors agreed with him aloud, almost simultaneously. He's right, sir, Warbane said. Well, not that specific plan, but taking Lockhorn out now, I mean. We could just all charge over and tear him into little annoying pieces, sir. He couldn't stand a chance. No, he's got the stone, remember, and possibly even other tricks. It's an unnecessary risk. We will take him out. With the rest of the trash, ordered Raiden. Now, let's get back in and finish him preparing. The Lakori out there is just trying to divide us before his backup arrives. Now the six entered the mansion and shut the door, sealing off their inevitable fate for a short time and proceeded to set up for the coming storm. We're still down one until John arrives, stated Thorn. And we could really use that hand of his, not to mention his seasoned experience in unwinnable battles. And two, interjected Wade. We're still down too if what the handsome man said is true. He said he would be sending a close friend to aid us in a common fight, so I guess we'll see. Wade said with just a hint of doubt in his voice. Well, now's not really the time to be fashionably late, said Thorn. But I know John, and if he's still breathing... Which is very likely. He will show. Everything is prepped, sir. All there is to do now is wait, said Reinhardt to Thorn, as he was staring out of the kitchen window intensely. Please, you don't have to say, sir, unless we're actually on official guardian business. And never while we are alone. Thorn said, laughing a bit. No, replied Reinhardt. Confidently. You've earned it. And have saved my life countless times, Thornwald. It is my honor to say as such. And Thorn turned and nodded at Reinhardt once, before turning back to gaze adamantly out of the kitchen window. Waiting, huh, is the worst part. Reinhardt added, watching him. Do you know how many battles I've just... Reinhardt began before the sound of whooshing helicopter blades was picked up in a distance by the two lacking super-advanced sense of hearing. Thorn ran to the back porch to inspect the situation, with Reinhardt close behind. Wade and Daniel ran outside quickly, as Ryden and Warbane casually made their way out. "'It's John!' yelled Thorn enthusiastically. "'He's here, Ryden!' Now the helicopter quickly made its way to the location, and circled the mansion once before positioning itself above the front entrance of the mansion, and with the side of the chopper and a rather large calibered machine gun facing the woods. Before anyone could establish any radio signal with John's chopper, 
let out a volley of machine gun fire into the woods directly in front of the mansion. No doubt trying to hit Lochran, thought Wade. And before the helicopter stopped firing, it dropped two large boxes that resembled shiny ammo caches, and lowered a rope at which John himself descended down skillfully. After reaching the ground, John waved at the chopper as it wasted no time in departing, and General Ryden made his way to greet the man, where instead of any formal or military gestures, the two hugged each other like long-lost brothers once again being reunited. John, said the general thankfully, well, it's good to see you. It's been far too long, my friend. Ah, thank the creator. John said upon embracing the giant golden lichen. When I heard we got lucky enough for your quad unit to be close enough, I knew God truly was intervening on our behalf, as he always will, answered Ryden confidently. Still, it's unfortunate Trower wasn't close enough by. I had literally just sent him to check out an anomaly occurring on the other side of the property, and his strength and powers would have proved beyond helpful. An arc wolf would have been a great gift tonight, but things like that happen for a reason. And you know it, my old apprentice. Wherever you sent him, I assure you destiny needs him there. So do not fret, my old friend. I have the best quad of lichens in the entire army. Speaking of, Reinhardt Warbane, yelled John. I've got two upgraded smart turrets here, gesturing towards the two shiny metallic boxes dropped by the helicopter moments before. And we need one set up on each side of the mansion in case they try flanking us or gliding above. Thorn, said John, take Wade and Daniel and have them help you set up our immediate and ranged weaponry. I want your unit to take advantage of those Anz eels and miniguns while they're still advancing from a distance, and then switch to rockets and some grenades. The second they break the tree line. Ryden, said John, I've got some melee weapons that might interest you. Take whatever you need. Actually, I really have finally perfected the thunder and lightning rule modulations, so she made something special for Reinhardt, Thorn, and myself while upgrading Warbane's fire runes on his weaponry. Ryden said, sounding rather pleased. Ah, very nice, responded John. Let's see how they like the taste of that. We don't have much time, John said loudly for everyone to hear. So I'm going to address everything, and then we will take formation outside the house. Because the ancient Akorai can bring the defences down. And you don't want to be trapped in here, if and when that happens. Our best chance is to be waiting on them and prepared. Pick as many off as we can with our range attacks and then unleash everything we have hard on them, while the smart turrets back us up. Plus, if we are outside, we can use the barrier spell as an indirect weapon, throwing enemies into, or dodging an attack, and letting them crash into the barrier. You've seen how much damage it can do to these fox. So don't forget that it's there. Now, to the big topic. Our handsome guest. Aurelia says we can fully trust him, and that was conveyed to her directly through the Archangels, who are the only four beings in existence right now, besides the Son, who can talk directly to the Creator face to face. And so it goes without saying... We can trust the handsome man now. The Thor looked around to everyone before stating, Who is this guy? I have a feeling we'll all know soon enough, answered John. Everything is set up, John, yelled Wade, who was busy lining up the last of the weapons and items. Wade noticed John looked down at the illuminated desk and would have sawed through it upon his armoured vest. Did you get a pretty good handle on using that thing? asked John. Yes, sir, answered Wade. And so did Daniel, added Wade. I assure you. Good, you boys will do just fine, John said, before taking formation with the others in front of the mansion. Outside of the mansion, the seven warriors stood poised in battle formation, awaiting the common storm that would herald their fate. It seemed the entire mountain knew what was coming. 
for a small stampede of random creatures came sprinting through the tree line, ignoring the seven soldiers and dashing past them and down the mountain as quickly as possible. Wade had never seen anything like this, with both bear, mountain lion, deer, fox, squirrel and rabbit alike, all running beside each other and without the slightest predatorial instinct on a mountain lion or bear to chase any of the easy prey. Like in that one moment, the animals collectively knew that they all had just become potential prey to what horrors were heading this way. The forest had become abnormally quiet as well, and Wade noticed it would even the very air pressure seem to start spiking. Directly after Wade and the others noticed this change in the environment, a small pink orb came flying towards them at an incredible speed. They're here, yelled the fairy as she broke the tree line. Thank you, Flora, said General Ryden. You should go ahead and cross the veil and leave, my dear. The ancient possessed dark magic that could even harm the fey folk. Gladly accepting the order, Flora quickly flew back inside the green and pink elaborate box as the entire thing disappeared with a bright pink flash, and then was gone. General Ryden, who was now standing in front of the line of men, turned to face everyone. It's time! He screamed, as the other three lichens howled a deep battle cry in anticipation for the glory of combat, regardless of the outcome. Wade and Daniel shared a knowing glance at one another, before Daniel spoke. Thank you for saving my life. Well, they would have sniffed me out from the back of that van for sure. So, no matter how this ends, thank you, Wade. Any time, answered Wade, before he looked down at the ground and inhaled deeply. Her name was Sarah. Wade said now, looking back at Daniel's eyes. My little brother was throwing a party for his birthday, and she didn't want to go. My brother and I had not seen each other in five years, and he just moved up here to Washington, so I begged and bugged her repeatedly until I wore her down. But she had minor social anxiety, and so most of the time she just wanted to relax at home, and just the two of us, which I loved about her, because I never really liked social events anyway, but... It was my little bro, and so I pushed it. And of course, she gave in and came. She always enjoyed making me happy, and I her. I didn't even drink that night, so we could leave early. She had only one cocktail herself. And it was a short but very sweet visit, which we both enjoyed, but we were ready to get home and drink some chamomile and coddle, which was our nightly routine, and the best memories of my life. We were T-boned by a drunk driver. Some other idiot leaving another worthless party. The report said she died on impact, but she didn't. Not instantly. She said my name as I watched the life leave her eyes. Watched all of our nights drinking tea and cuddling on the couch. I had wedding plans and a daughter we always wanted to have funnel down her pupils, like two black holes pulling away my entire universe. After that night, I lost my purpose. Worked only to survive in a world I didn't want to live in without her anymore. I've never been the same since. Wade softly concluded as he noticed that not only Daniel, but John and the Lycans were all staring at him sympathetically. Do you know why I moved up here, Wade? John asked. You lost your wife and couldn't stand living in the home you two shared any longer? Wade responded before connecting together events that John had previously explained to him. Remembering how Lochran had given him his scars and taken his original hand, and how when John spoke of the beast, how he would be filled with a contempt that was beyond just being injured. A contempt that could only originate on a loss of your greatest passion, your love. He killed her, didn't he? Asked Wade, nodding his head towards the first edge. She was a veiled guardian like myself, John began. We trained and fought together since we were very young, barely teenagers. We were raised our entire lives to defend the Ark families and then Arella herself. Twenty years ago, the Dark Lord Samuel put low, the first Lacore and his ancients, on a new mission. They started seizing and corrupting trees of life for their own foul purposes. Among many things these trees can do, they can instantly transmit or teleport you rather exactly where you want to go, or exactly where you need to go, depending on the intent of the individual as they pass through it. 
Now, because of this, they are very well guarded. We construct small fortresses around them, putting up protective barrier spells to keep any evil out. The Lakwari had always taken three trees, and once they corrupt them with dark energy, they can be relocated. And so, it's not as easy as just regrouping with backup and taking it back. Once they corrupt it, it's virtually gone. And takes much time, power, magic and resources to scribe for their location. My wife Rosalind and I were stationed at the next and closest tree, and we knew that they would be coming for it soon enough. So we had extra large army and more weapons and armaments than usual. Whatever they are taking the trees for, it drastically increased the Korai numbers. We didn't have a chance. Our defenses were overrun within seconds, and almost everyone I personally asked to be stationed there died. And as Lokren stood above me, ready to finish me off, Rosalind blasted him back with a last orb staff and thrust a teleportation stone on my chest and said a rella before I could even argue. This brought me directly to Arella's personal security room, where she was watching the monitor with my wife still on it. As Lochran charged toward her, she used her last light spell to self-destruct herself, the army, and at the time, we assumed Lochran as well. And she sacrificed herself for me, said John in an appreciative sad tone. Lochran's distant demonic laughter could be heard throughout the forest after John recalled his painful memory to the others. John looked towards the forest, apparently on phase. He's not like any of the others you know, John said. Lochran is unique among his kind. He is the only Lokorai to be born instead of being made or reborn. He's more than just Lo's creation. He is his biological son. And I don't mean Lo had a son before he was transformed into the first Lokorai. No. Ancients can take on a humanoid shape and shrink down to about six to six and a half feet tall. They still have to move around in robes or cloaks on this side of the veil, though, for their skin will be an unnatural whitish grey, and they still have fangs, claws, and soulless black eyes. And the ground began to rhythmically start rumbling in the far distance of the forest, giving a prelude, soft beat, for the vicious and chaotic melody approaching. They are coming, whispered Thorn, almost under his breath, before John continued. Lo and Samuel spent years perfecting a fertility spell infused with dark and unholy magic, and unfortunately, they succeeded. John stared at the ground while pausing to exhale deeply, before finally finding a will to continue on. <sighs> Lo and his humanoid form raped a young virgin girl, and after only three hours of incubation, Lochran's first sentient act was to claw his way out of his mother and consume every ounce of her flesh. Fucking hell, Daniel responded, as Wade and the others seemed virtually speechless at being informed to such vile knowledge of the creature. They were mere yards away from. And deep, demonic laughter began emanating from the tree line as the pitch of the amused voice slowly started rising until it took on the same familiar and proper tone Lochran preferred to converse with. Sweet mummy dearest, you know I've eaten quite a few virgins since then, but not one as delicious as her. Your first is always your best, am I right? said Lochran, chuckling ever so slightly, concluding his statement. One day, I'm going to silence that toxic mouth of yours forever, screamed John with powerful conviction in his voice. No time like the present, Johnny boy, Lochran taunted, before taking a few lumbering steps forward, displaying his full and terrifying size as he stood upright, with his shoulders widened and his muscled chest stuck out. The mansion's floodlights lit up the tree line well showing how truly bigger and different Lokran was from a normal Lokore, and with his skin and fur pitch black and his size considerably bigger. Pretty tough with an entire army behind you, said Thorn mockingly, as he stepped forward to accept Lokran's challenge, before Raiden held out a massive arm, signaling him to stop. Don't let his poisonous words infect you, 
said Raiden. His time will come. And Thorn nodded at Raiden before stepping back into formation, and snarling just a bit at Lochran as he did so. That's right, little pup, yelled Lochran. Go hide while you... Lochran was finally cut off as the body of another Lacore went crashing into him at an unprecedented speed. And at first, Wade thought another Lacore was attacking Lochran, and apparently so did he, for Lochran thrashed around for a couple of seconds before quickly and effortlessly grabbing that other creature by its throat and pinning it against a nearby tree. However, he soon realized he was holding a mangled corpse of the subordinate he had sent to look for Wade's scent just the night prior. I was wondering what became of you, said Lochran, holding his dead comrade. Lochran closed his massive clawed hand around the dead creature's throat, instantly decapitating it, as he drew his attention in towards the direction the dead creature had originated from. The mansion's guardians turned their heads as well. It's him, exclaimed Wade in utter surprise. It's the giant deer I saw on my way up the mountain days ago. Well, the eyes are different now, though, observed Wade, referring to the deep dark green that glowed from the deer's eyes, illuminating bright and unnaturally. The deer seems even bigger now, too, started Wade, before General Ryden spoke up in an imperative tone. That's no deer, Ryden said in shocked awe. That's an elemental. I thought they were supposed to be neutral, asked Thorn. They are, answered Ryden, unable to give any explanation, even to himself. The deer lightly stomped its right front hoof onto the ground, and upon doing so, dark green radiating energy began creeping towards the seven guardians, moving in randomly segmented lines, not unlike veins, before it stopped in front of them, coming together as a recognisable message. If nothing is done, the Lacorai plague will destroy both mankind and forest dwellers alike. I have made a choice to fight for the light, and gave a very close friend my word, that if the Ancient reaches this mansion, I would help stop him. I am here to honour that promise, and take a stand. After seven guardians read this, the elemental moved to stand in front of the line, now leading the fight against the Ancient directly. Eight now stood awaiting the storm of hell that blew their way, united as an unwavering force, as the marching army's footsteps were now so close. It shook the ground with every impact, foretelling the arrival of the abominable threat and the dark, eldritch leader. Wade could now feel his chest vibrate from the army's encroaching footfalls, and nodded at Daniel once before pressing the chest adapter on his vest activating the sword module mech suit as it formed around him in mere seconds, with Daniel quickly doing the same. Wade now stood over eight feet tall off the ground, with only his face now visible and illuminated by the suit's face visor. Every inch of his arms, save for his elbow, where large energized blades were chatted out, was covered in advanced ammo drums that circled his arms in metal rings, before connecting into four barrels at his knuckles that fired explosive rounds at an extremely high velocity. This connected down into superheated claws at his fingertips for quick melee combat. They held the ability to cut through steel like warm butter. Wade's shoulders bore two smart mini turrets, in which one held automatic grenades, and the other contained armor-piercing machine gun rounds, which both fired independently from his manual commands helping to produce cover fire for him and his fellow soldiers during intense combat. Both wrists also had tri-barrel attachments, where the top and the largest barrel produced a large sword-like blade that was actually superheated like his claws, and where the bottom two barrels were actually simply upgraded flame throwers. Daniel now stood almost 12 feet tall in a much larger and more heavily armoured shield mech suit. His only real offensive weapons were his extremities in which his fists, elbows, head, knees and feet were all infused with sensory adapters that cause severe amplified kinetic impact upon striking a target. In other words, one solid punch could almost vaporize a Lacorai head, or punch through reinforced steel like cardboard. The same could be said about all of his suit's other extremities, 
And, in addition to these devastating melee attacks, Daniel's mech could also create extremely powerful energy layers from nanoreceptors, which projected out condensed energy from his forearm, creating nearly indestructible shields to protect his fellow warriors, or even crush an opponent to death between two at once. When sword and shield mechs fight side by side together fluently, by two who have mastered the art, they are nearly unstoppable. Said Rose earlier in the training room, Wade hoped Daniel and himself had simply learned enough to survive. I had no reservations about mastering the mech suit's full potential in five hours of training. Alright, does everyone remember our plan with the gifted artifacts? Asked Wade out loud to his compatriots. Thorn held up the obsidian key, signalling to Wade that he was ready, as Ryden did the same with a translucent golden horn. Reinhardt and Warbane both held up a 20mm and Zeo rifle and readied themselves. Since the Lycans could fire the gargantuan rifle standing without any kickback, John had customised the rifles to more comfortably fit the wolves' physiology, as well as add an extended drum barrel clip to highly increase the amount of ammunition that could be held at once. Shadows were now becoming visible through the tree line, as the rhythmic beat of the marching army hit its crescendo, and then stopped completely about 700 yards away, which was the distance between the forest edge and the mansion's entrance, and the entirety of their battlefield. The silence around them was unlike anything Wade had ever experienced, like the whole of existence was holding its breath, awaiting the night's outcome. The unnatural silence was broken by the light footsteps of a silhouette much smaller than the rest of the army, breaking through the tree line just enough to be visibly noticed, and then stopped. The figure then held out his hands and emitted a wave of black energy that moved like a shockwave until reaching the mansion and made the spotlights rust and corrode in mere seconds before they crashed to the ground, snuffing out all light pointed towards the forest. This move was in vain, however, if the figure was trying to take away the warrior's vision, for John simply pushed a button on the side of his helmet as an illuminated visor slid down over his face, giving him advanced night vision, as Wade and Daniel's visors simply auto-adjusted immediately to the change of lighting. And seeing as the Lycans already had super-enhanced night vision, they made no move whatsoever as their eyes were illuminated with powerful lunar energy, like the moon itself was always within them. Wade looked around in awe at the world surrounding him now, for unlike the green lines of a standard night vision goggles, his visor illuminated the world more naturally, like an invisible moon was lighting up the world around him at every angle, and not too bright as to distract him, but just perfect, even lighting up organic beings such as the Lacorai in brighter contrast. Wade briefly wondered if this is how the Lycans always saw the night, before his attention was drawn towards the cloak figure leading the army, no doubt the ancient Lecorae. Watching as the man removed his hood, shown his white skin and fierce shark-like teeth, and an unreservedly sinister smile. Steady, said John. Everybody wait until I give the word. The Ancient advanced forward about fifty more yards, and then stopped again, as the deer did the exact same. The two powerful entities stood four hundred feet apart from one another, assessing each other's powers respectively. The Ancient Akorai and the Elemental stood quiet like this for a long moment, before the Ancient finally spoke up. You break your own laws, standing here this night, Elemental, screamed the Ancient in a loud demonic baritone that sounded like it was being played through loudspeakers from the forest. If you stand here against me in the open defiance, your neutrality, all of your kind's neutrality and safety will cease to exist, along with a treaty of light and darkness that you will have broken. The elemental stomped its hoof aggressively upon the ground and upon doing so, a large vine covered in dark green glowing runes came to life on the tree next to where the ancient stood, and swiftly impaled itself within the back of the closest Lacorai foot soldier. 
The impaled monster went stiff for about a half a second before its eyes began glowing a familiar dark green, like the runes on the vine. The monster's body relaxed before standing upright and facing the ancient directly, before he conveyed his message. If I do not stand against the Lakorai plague this night, it will keep growing until all forest life becomes snuffed out, and the elementals along with it. I have made my choice, Darkling, said the deer. The earth somehow became even more still, thought Wade. Even the wind itself seemed to be holding its breath, waiting for the battle's conclusion before even daring to exhale. My army still had numbers yours, fifty-two to eight. Those are not fledgling Lakorai behind me. I brought only the biggest, strongest, and most capable soldiers. So, if you still wish to not move and protect this mansion... I will deliver upon you a massacre of my finest effort, said the Ancient enthusiastically. Sir, Lochran spoke up, dropping from a nearby tree to land directly in front of the Ancient. They received aid from a powerful entity. It would be wise to hold for more reinforcements, sir. I think the entity was... Silence, screamed the Ancient impatiently. Your pre-strike unit has failed, and I do not need advice from an overrated prodigal son, yelled the Ancient. Hellrock, screamed Lochran, loudly and almost aggressively. Listen to me. However, the Ancient, who was apparently named Elrock, swung a large shadow-like claw appendage that emerged from his right hand, striking at Lochran. Impressively, though, Lochran was too fast, dodging his strike and jumping back where he took a battle stance in which his enormous claws began coalescing with dark shadow-like energy that made the grass, trees and every living thing within ten feet of Lochran instantly begin to rot and wither away until it was nothing more than ash. If you're not going to help fight, said Elrock, then why don't you just run on back home to Daddy and tell the Master that I will be bringing both John and Elemental's head back to adorn his halls with. Be sure to tell them that after you explain how horribly you failed here, said the Ancient mockingly to Lochran. After who I saw here tonight, the tree will be of little importance to Lord Samwell. This mountain will be your tomb, Elrock, Lochran said grinning before jumping back into the treetops with one amazing leap. Now Wade couldn't tell for sure, but it appeared Lockhorn almost glided up through the air effortlessly, after leaping an incredible distance. Fine, hissed Elrock. Getting out of my way is the most helpful you have been so far, he said to Lockhorn contemptibly. Elrock turned on his heel swiftly to face the Guardians, as black shadows began pouring from him like dark sentient smoke. Last chance. Will you move or will you die? Asked the ancient Lakorai, as the shadows swelling around him began to intensify. The guardian stood poised and resolute before John squeezed his metallic hand into a fist, making the engraved runes glow like fire as flames began to arrive around his closed hand. Raiden pulled out an enormous long sword, and with yellowish golden runes glowing deeply upon its blade, as the air around the sword itself seemed to shimmer, like heat rising off asphalt on the hottest of summer days. Thorn pulled an elegant yet dangerous looking platinum coloured spear that seemed to grow much longer once he unsheathed it from his back. The spear's blade and shaft were covered in whitish blue coloured runes, in which strong electrical current danced between them begging to be unleashed. The spear tip alone had now grown long and large enough to cut a Lakorai in half, and with a weapon's entire reach spanning about ten feet long at its full length. But Wade had a feeling Thorn could will the blade to be shorter if the battle called for it. Raiden and Thorn both thrust their weapons into the ground respectively to be at the ready, before Raiden picked up a minigun and Thorn an automatic grenade launcher, 
Reinhardt and Warbane picked up their Anzio 20mm rifles and stood at a ready, not yet unsheathing their melee weaponry. Ah, oh, I was hoping for this, said Elrock excitedly as he held his arms outstretched and stared upwards into the night sky. It's been a very long time since I've been able to have some real fun let alone unfurl and be able to stretch out with my true form and unleash my full power. The air seemed to both spike in pressure and take on an unnatural chill as the shadows around Elrock now fully enveloped him, where deep beast-like roars began growing in volume and lowering in pitch. This continued until nothing but Vanta Black voided out sphere was all that was visible until an oversized clawed arm larger than a greyhound bus emerged from the void, shaking the earth as it impacted the ground. Succeeding its other massive arm, the beast had exited the shadow in a gloriously horrific spectacle, for where normal Lacore had parted the head symmetrically infused with bone-like exoskeletons, the entirety of the ancient's face and head were covered in this marrow-like armour. The simplest description Wade could mentally fathom at the time was as if a Lacorai foot soldier was mixed with a dragon of the most dark and demonic esoteric origins. Even its fur wasn't fur, but the same shadow-like energy in which he was emerging from, just mimicking fur. This black energy shrouded the core of the ancient's body like a dark and intelligent blanket that moved in its own jerky and unnerving motions, like it was a whole entire other monster itself. And Delrock now stood on all fours, in a more fixated quadruple state now, almost as tall as a seven-story mansion, appearing like some kind of bone dragon, an abomination of the most unholy and eldritch design. Before Wade could properly start worrying about Erok's new size and how the elemental could possibly fare against the behemoth, the deer raised high on its hind legs and came down hard on the earth with its front hooves, instantly doubling its own size as it did so, and causing dark green flames to engulf its antlers as lightning of the same color surged through the tips of them. The elemental repeated this process twice more until it not only matched Elrock's size, but its own antlers stood even taller and more prominent than the ancients now, and with its eyes completely blazing in dark green. The elemental stomped its hooves to the ground more subtly this time, causing two dark green illuminated lines to shoot through the ground from its hooves, before breaking wide and darting to parallel sides of the army deep in the forest. Powerfully frightening crackling and crashing sounds went off around the army, making them move close together before something very large burst through the tree line on opposing sides of the army. Even after everything Wade had witnessed, he was having trouble believing the two full-grown red cedar trees had just came to life and began moving on opposing sides of the battlefield until they stopped halfway, probably to keep the Lacore from flanking us by circling around. The trees had merged all of their many limbs into one large arm like appendage on each side and did the same with their roots, forming rudimentary legs and feet. They had vague human expressions where Wade assumed their face would be, and with leaves of course coming together to make hair on the large bark covered faces. However, Elrock wasn't waiting around for the elemental to reveal any more tricks, and with an ungodly loud demonic battle cry of pure rage, the fight had officially begun. And with the fifty experienced elite Lacorai soldiers following their master into the fray, yipping rapidly like hungry hyenas about to feast on a nest of prey. Now! John yelled, and Thorn threw the large obsidian key covered in flaming runes directly in front and slightly into the onslaught of charging beasts. With over a dozen creatures passing the key's landfall before it actually hit the ground, making it land almost in the middle the army, as the rest of the Lycans began firing their long-range weaponry at the front of the stampede. In truth, not one of the Guardians knew what kind of outcome to expect from the handsome man's unorthodox gifts, and so, as the first item neared the ground, like the wind, they held their breaths in hopeful anticipation.
Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one. Wow. What an absolutely intriguing, chest-pounding, incredible story there. From our good friend and brand new author to the show, a Mr. David Morning Wee. I really hope you enjoyed that one as much as I. I know my voice is literally breaking and wanted to quit altogether. Big thank you, David, of course, for penning this and getting it over to me. Absolutely fantastic writing and character development. And I really can't wait to see what you take us next on your adventures. As ever, I hope you enjoyed my rendition and eagerly await any updates in the future. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really, really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you all had a fantastic start to the month and an even better end to the week. And I'm looking forward to putting your feet up for the weekend with good food and drink and even better company. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.